Okay, so why don't we get started? Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to uh, our next session in this great series that we've got underway here. Eight sessions. Uh, well, you know, at least when I went to college, that was two thirds of a semester. Um, so we've got quite a program underway, and I think you're all enjoying it. We've got a lot of great comments from people. Uh, I certainly am too. Um, I'll dispense with the intro. We all kind of know Mark at this point, and we got a lot to cover. The one thing I will mention is next week, remember, uh, the third week, I will send a note around right after that session about the fourth week possibly being in person in the library. Uh, don't worry, we'll still Zoom broadcast it, but that we will have Mark in the library for the fourth and final week. Uh, we'll have a little uh, a little hors d'oeuvres and wine and, and tea and coffee and water and conversation and chatter after the series is over. So I'll be sending a note around to everybody and and polling us on uh, who would come to that. I hope with the uh, the shifting of the sun and the driving at night and the weather and everything else that uh, we get a decent response because I think it would be a great way to wrap things up. Anyway, so look for that after next week. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. He's already told me that uh, he's going to uh, prompt uh, comments and things pretty early on, uh, maybe particularly because this book is somewhat unusual in its form and the way the author has put it together. So put your thinking caps on early. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Uh, thank you, Michael. Once again, thank you for the continued invitation. Thank you all for coming. I'm especially happy uh, that some uh, months ago, Michael agreed to my proposed reset after we did Catcher in the Rye and On the Road, uh, that we do some novels by women uh, about people who we might not usually associate as protagonists in the great American novel. And I wanted to distance this program, in fact, from that term, great American novel. And three of the novels that I particularly had in mind were last time's Housekeeping uh, by Marilyn Robinson, tonight's The House on Mango Street, uh, and next time's the shawl for reasons that I hope are obvious. I don't think anybody would mistake any one of those three novels for the template of whatever pundits and literary history and college textbooks say about the great American novel. I think they are all great. Uh, the shawl was written slightly earlier in two installments than The House on Mango Street, but I moved The House on Mango Street up 1984, to put it alongside housekeeping uh, for this emphasis on the centrality of the house in each of these two novels. So uh, I also want to say that you're probably aware that a couple of days ago, uh, the great Cormac McCarthy, certainly one of the most significant American novelists of the latter half of what I have to call now the last century, died. And I had already planned with Michael's permission to have the next installment of this course include a novel by him and some of his uh, contemporaries. So about the house on Mango Street, uh, I hope it's fair to say that if you didn't read it, it wasn't because you didn't have time. Um, it is so short as a novel uh, that many people would first think that it's not a novel. Uh, it is only a um, hundred and eight pages of the text proper. There's an important introduction, which is a significant part of the book. A hundred eight pages of 44 vignettes, what she calls in the intro, little, little story. They average a little over two and a half pages each. They range from three and a half pages to 72 words. And I wonder if keeping in mind um, the form of the novel, if I could invite you to say, and um, I don't like to contradict Michael, but you don't have to put your thinking caps on. I'm not asking you to be analytical. I'm asking you to be to report. Uh, if you read this novel for the first time for this evening, or you can remember when you first read it in whatever context, I would love to have you say in the chat something, uh, volunteer something that you'd like to speak, and Michael will acknowledge you about your reaction to reading the novel, good, bad, or indifferent. And I'm thinking especially about the challenge for some 
or the exhilaration of encountering such a different form, again, whether you read it in the 80s when it first came out or in the anniversary edition 25 years later or just days ago for this series. So Michael, I'll let you be the watchkeeper. Okay, folks, so as usual, use the Q&A to, uh, to send me uh, any comments you've got and I'll, I'll relay them and uh, we'll, we'll talk about them and then go from there. I'm imagining dozens of keyboards being tapped on out in, out in cyberspace. So I, I just wanna say in order to lubricate uh, the avenue to the question, I really just want to report, uh, again, uh, I, I'm sure you can do thinking, but um, did you find it destabilizing and disorienting? Did the novel put you off in its style? Uh, did your reaction to it change between beginning it and ending it or in a first reading or second reading? I, I'd really be interested since we have nearly 50 of you, and I'm sure some of you have been to more than one of these uh, presentations. I don't mean that you have experience with me necessarily, but you have the experience of a number of American novels. What do you think about the Mango Street? So the first commenter says, found it delightful, first time read, love the fact that had to get the book from the young adult section of the library and appeals to different ages and generations. Yes, and I want to say I, I welcome that comment, whoever that first responder was. Uh, you'll remember that in her introduction, she makes a point of wanting to cross the genre line between fiction and poetry, between adult books and young adult books and children's literature. Uh, she wants to be genre bending. Uh, I mentioned last time in a very short preview of this book, uh, that if you're writing a different kind of literature for a different kind of readership, uh, in this case, a Mexican-American woman writing about her culture, and you'll notice that the remarkable thing about the book is it's not about oppression of Latinx people in America in the 70s and 80s. It's a celebration of Mexican-American culture in a neighborhood that you wouldn't know had anything to do with a racist or a marginalized America. That's not what this book does. It's a celebration of a girl, uh, the writer fictionalized as Esperanza. Even in the introduction, there's this doubleness between the woman in that photo and the woman who's writing those words. There's a lot of doubleness in the novel. She talks about if she thinks about her life in her Spanish voice, she thinks she should have gotten married and had children. If she thinks about it in her English voice, she thinks she should have moved out of home earlier. So this notion of shifting the genre, not just having something new to say, but a new way to say it, and the idea of snipping things apart in order to put them back together. She says that some of her stories on base, are based on people she met, some on people that she made up, some are a blending of the two. There's that doubleness again. So the doubleness of me back then and me now, always a challenge and a feature of memoir writing, whether autobiographical or fictionalized autobiography. The doubleness of thinking like her Spanish self or thinking like her American self. The doubleness of being herself, uh, Sandra Cisneros, but also being figured as uh, Esperanza and so on. The great um, Spanish writer Juan Ramon Jimenez, who won the Nobel Prize in 1956, uh, is quoted uh, at the beginning of Fahrenheit 451, uh, which is a book about book burning, uh, you probably know. The epigram that Ray, the epigraph that Ray Bradbury uses in that novel is from Jimenez, if they give you ruled paper, write the other way. If they give you ruled paper, write the other way. Now he means it partly, Jimenez does, as a kind of defiance, and he's part of a 1950s literary revival of Spanish culture. But for many um, quote unquote minority writers out of the mainstream writers, what they're really saying is, they can't tell their story in the old fashioned 
linear, I'm being punning now, linear, a uh, rationative way. Um, when people talk about Marquez and other writers being mag magical realists, a term he didn't like but came to accept, uh, that people fly off, uh, people eat dirt, people do things that are just not possible, um, like in uh, Beloved, Tony Morrison's Beloved, it's not the novel we did, but we could have. Well, you have to believe, if you want to believe the story, that a dead woman has come back to life. Uh, the idea of what's uh, possible in fiction may be possible in life. Uh, that idea uh, is that they feel like you cannot write the normal uh, Anglo-Western uh, Lockean way of talking about the world. You have to find another way to write. And that's part of what she's doing. As a consequence, many people really don't like the book or are put off by it early enough that they don't finish it. And I want to make it clear, I welcome those comments as well. The book and I will take care of ourselves. So if anyone has something additional or other to say, I welcome you. Well, we have a few more comments, so I'll take them one at a time. Reading this was like driving through a neighborhood in the dark and seeing into the lives of a variety of homes, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Only a glimpse, but there is clearly tantalizingly more going on behind each scene. Yeah, again, uh, you know, maybe I should just quit talking and let everyone comment. That's that's uh, very sharp. Uh, I will say that one of the things about a lot of the novels that we've read is they either have the burden of writing about America with a capital A, or we burden those writers like Faulkner and Fitzgerald for representing something big about America, the great American novel. And we forget how much can be done by writing about a neighborhood or a block. We see that in A Tree Grows in Brooklyn or Call It Sleep, uh, that there's not only the issue that America is partly regional literature, it's partly a matter of neighborhoods. And everybody in this room, uh, almost everybody in this room, whatever your age or background, has an experience of your de development of your personality, your character, your personhood through a neighborhood. And I think that's a brilliant shorthand description, whoever just gave that praise. Thank you for that. Well, and, and another person commented before your comment that it made the person think of A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, the vignette approach about growing up in a multi-ethnic neighborhood from the point of view of a child made me think that perhaps Cisneros wanted to do the Latina version of that book. Ah, yeah, I, 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 that well may be. I always assume that it's more of a cognate that is cousins parallel rather than deriving from, but it well may be. But, you know, if you think back to the House of Mirth or This Side of Paradise or In Our Time or The Sound and the Fury, none of those novels give a sense that there was someone living in a community that we call a neighborhood. Call It Sleep, though, does have that. Their Eyes Were Watching God has a very fostering uh, neighborhood for uh, the African-Americans in that book. Um, the Heart is a Lonely Hunter has some of that. Certainly, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn has that. On the Road is a rejection of the support of that, uh, but we'll see some of that again and again. Uh, and Housekeeping, uh, is bred for people who might have flourished in such a neighborhood, but in fact are wired differently. So uh, again, um, invite the other people who are waiting to comment or have you read them, Michael. Sure. Uh, so uh, Kevin says, I read this yesterday and it took me a while to get used to the vignette style, but I liked it. I especially liked the change in subject focus and language as she grew older. Uh, I, I'm wondering, you grew older through the course of the vignette, I'm taking it. Yes. Time. Yeah, yeah. And of course, deepens when uh, writing becomes more and more, you know, the introduction. And let me say, you should always read introductory material to a work of literary art if it's written by the author. And you should never read introductory material that's written by anybody else including me, should I ever do that? You should never read a critic, a scholar, a publisher, a friend of the author's intro, 
if they have the bad sense to put it up front, because they talk about things as if you've already read the book, whether it's uh, arrogance or the assumption that you're coming back to this book for the second time, and there's uh, spoilers all over the place. So uh, she does say, though, in the in the front about how much she wants to be a writer. It's a very writerly introduction. Uh, in fact, talking about uh, in the very beginning uh, that she wants to have um, uh, a um, house of my own, uh, and then also talking about her office. A house of my own, of course, is an echo of Virginia Woolf's 1929 essay, A Room of One's Own, which is specifically about women needing money, actual money income, and space, a room in which to write, in which to be and to write. And 1929 happens to be the year in the UK, one year later than women in Britain were given full access to suffrage and could vote. It was some years in the making. Uh, we weren't so far ahead of them, uh, we, 1920. Um, I'm not saying that's why she wrote it, but clearly Sandra Cisneros is giving a nod towards Virginia Woolf and the idea that this office that we see her sitting in in the photograph at the beginning converted from a bedroom uh, and what better notion of uh, domesticity being supplanted by creativity that a woman's bedroom, in this case, it's a child's bedroom, gets converted into an office to give her space to write. Yeah, and more and more as the book goes on, she becomes clearer and clearer. She reads her poems to a blind aunt. She exchanges poems with a friend. She becomes more and more aware as the protagonist in the book of her writerliness. Sure. Yeah, interesting suggestions regarding destabilization, discomfort, I suppose from the reader's perspective, that sort of thing. It was like looking through a door intriguing, intriguingly open on a world that novels don't usually bother with. People who don't know they're in a fictive world. Walmart and Dairy Queen are just around the corner, that sort of thing. But I haven't read it for years. Well, let me say that uh, when she mentions in the beginning, she likes the idea of cutting things up and putting them back together. It put me in mind of the fiction writer, Donald Bartolme, who said famously that collage is the art form of the 20th century. Now, collage as an art form was partly uh, introduced by Pablo Picasso. Uh, and you know that some of his uh, paintings, which are a combination of um, geometric shapes and realism, looked like something was torn apart and put together uh, not quite neatly. And if you know his great sculpture that's called something like Steer's Head, which has a triangular bicycle seat, everybody knows the shape of that bicycle seat that leaves a memory in your lower region if you bike for a long time. He took a bicycle seat, just the triangular shape, and he soldered to it the handlebars, the curved handlebars that you can all see also. And he called it steer's head as if it were a skeleton of a steer's head. And of course, that's exactly what it looks like. The shape of a steer's um, skull and the shape of the um, horns, which don't disintegrate. And what you do when you look at that is you see the bicycle and you see the steer because Picasso saw it first. And when I mentioned this in a class in Trinity College years ago, an impossibly young man said, yeah, but Professor Schenker, I, I could have done that. Yes, Billy, but you didn't. Pablo Picasso saw the bicycle in the steer and the steer in the bicycle. And many of his works and many works of the 20th century, visual arts and um, literature are collages uh, like uh, Ulysses, like Guernica, uh, take it apart and put it together so that your reader has to collaborate with the integration. You don't have an overarching plot in this book. There is no plot in the conventional sense, 
But with the comment that was just made by the person who said it was disorienting and then uh, more comfortable, what happens is you find yourself participating without realizing it in giving it the form that it's suggesting. It's very much like the person who resists going to uh, an independent or foreign film uh, that's not in English and has subtitles. And I actually had a member of my extended family say that they hated subtitled movies because they didn't go to the movies to read. And when there was some great movie that they had to see and had to see in subtitles, they went. And what happened to him is what happens to many people. He remembered the movie as being in English. That although he began with the discomfort of having to look up and down, he recalled the movie some weeks later as if the characters were speaking English, the tone of their voice, but English, because he collaborated in the unification of the English captions and the visual of the movie. And I think something like that happens here. The collage invites you to understand why it's fragmented. These people do not have nine to five lives. She does not begin. My father worked for many years down by the docks and my mother, my family comes from, it doesn't have that kind of David Copperfield, whether I shall be the hero of my life or not, these pages must tell. It comes out in a different way. It is very reader oriented, just like young adult fiction. One of the things about reading children's literature and young adult literature is the writer is almost always generous towards the reader not in a patronizing way. The, the diction, the vocabulary, uh, the level of intellectual um, engagement is very high in those books, um, but it's not written in the usual way, which can be disorienting for some adults. Great. So, uh, so Janet says, uh, I always remember Sandra's essay that I taught to college freshmen in which she won over her father that she is in college not to find a husband, but to develop her writing. And her first novel about her family and her father won him over. Uh, and I like the idea that she decided to live in Mexico. <laughs> yeah, and she talks about that circular, my, thank you for that comment. Uh, she talks about that circular migration where they go from Mexico to the states and states to Mexico and so on. And, you know, we have two big countries uh, that border um, on the North American continent. We call ourselves Americans, but there are lots of uh, countries that are American, if you count uh, both continents. And of course, there is a Canadian influence on American culture, especially in some Northern states, but it does not compare to the great influence of Mexican culture, not just on the southern states of the country near the border, but all of America and the great explosion of uh, Latinx people uh, from Mexico and other places. Um, and, you know, more and more America is becoming a country where Spanish language and Spanish culture uh, can be found nearly everywhere. And, you know, for some people, that's a great worry. Um, about worried about white privilege or white dominance, but it's a fact of many cultures around the world. Uh, Europe is much healthier about this. Africa and India are way ahead of us, uh, that the borders between provinces or states or countries are artificial and they shouldn't govern uh, the interactions among people and cultures. So this person said she read it for the first time but did not find it very interesting. However, enjoyed the structure, appreciated the accessibility to all, and welcomed the Latina American perspective. Yeah, and again, uh, you know, there may be someone in the group of, it looks like 49, 47 attendees who really disliked it, who may or may not want to share that, um, or not only disliked it, but thought that they don't understand what the big deal is. Uh, I think it's perfectly understandable, if not for me to say acceptable or not, of course, any reaction is acceptable, that people would have difficulty or just not like it. It's just not being to their taste. Um, 
uh, my book groups in June decide what they want to read in the fall, and they like to read a big novel over the summer. And there have been nominations for a handful of really big novels, one of which is Tomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, which I have read and I liked well enough to have read once. But when the group asked me my opinion, I said that I thought it was a tough read uh, and that they may enjoy, they're not looking for a beach read, but they're looking for an inviting book. And I thought that we might do better than David Copperfield. I know people who taught me in my earlier years of education who would be horrified that I was suggesting people not read The Magic Mountain. So no accounting for taste, including mine. Yes, Any and, every, and everybody's got their, their own reactions. You could you could have a positive or negative reaction about the content per se, or you could have a positive or negative reaction to the stylism that just doesn't click with you while you're trying to, you know, read through it. Yeah. We're so the last the bottom of the hour, let's take one more. Okay, well, we have one more. So she Excellent. faced financial difficulties and a conservative society that may not have been welcoming or supportive. Do you know, did she ever speak about this? Uh, so I, I confess that I am not well versed in her essays or speeches or other literary works. Uh, this is the only book of hers that I know. I know it very well. And I have taught it in schools um, and in uh, libraries, and I've done it with a couple of my book groups um, over a course of maybe 20 years. Uh, it may be that someone else in the group knows the answer to that, and they can feed it to Michael for us to share offline. Uh, I, I don't know. I do know that what she talks about in the introduction, the praise she has for her mother being a remarkable woman and very different from the writerly woman she wants to be, and the not surprising attitude of her father, who I know from something she wrote about her life, um, she was one of seven children um, uh, and uh, six boys, and she the one girl. And her father would routinely refer to his having six sons and one daughter. Uh, and you can hear what that would mean to anyone, especially if you're the daughter hearing yourself parsed out that way. I think those influences uh, of her mother, who like her uh, agent, she addresses directly. It turns out that her mother's visit, uh, where she talks about um, happiness that she has this um, office now and uh, says good lucky to her. And the last words of uh, the intro is, Cisneros repeating, I say to you, good lucky. And uh, her mother dies uh, on the 1st of November, 2007, uh, just some months before this introduction to the 25th anniversary. That is the book has now lived for a generation. Uh, uh, genealogists talk about a century being between 25 and 33 years. Um, so the importance of her mother uh, and her father in the introduction and in her life, less so in the novel per se. But um, again, I think if we think of the vignettes as a way to give us a um, impressionistic sense of the world and not to clutter us up, she follows Joyce by not putting quotation marks around quotes. Uh, Joyce got rid of them when he was first writing fiction on the ground that people could figure it out and that it was a distraction. And many writers, uh, in English at least, uh, in the 20th century followed him in that. It has, it doesn't have a lot of things that a novel would have. It doesn't have significant chapters. It does not have, as I said, a plot. It doesn't have a trajectory, not just the plot, but a sense of telling you where things are going. And if we think of it in terms of the great American novel, there's no reference to broad concerns like the American landscape, manifest destiny, uh, the idea of uh, social mobility beyond wanting to have her own house, which of course is one way that this novel connects to the American dream. Uh, it doesn't talk much about uh, culture, whether it's a melting pot or a salad bowl, 
because she is not writing about other cultures, she's writing about her culture. And so one of the questions that arises is, if it doesn't have the usual markers, the usual elements of a novel, American or otherwise, what would you say are the distinct markers of the literary qualities of this book? What do we get in place of a regular character development in a linear way, a, uh, a plot overall, uh, significant installments that we've come to see as chapters and so on? That, that's not a non-rhetorical question. So uh, what I, I said, when, when I, designed this uh, course on um, We Two Are Here, I was thinking in particular of housekeeping, Mango Street and the shawl. You'll see that next time. What would you say we get in the house on Mango Street that is satisfying from a literary point of view that differs from what we might expect in a typical great American novel, significant American novel? So in the interest of time, I'm going to answer my own question. Um, often questions I ask uh, are open-ended, and I'm interested in your answer only. That is, I don't have an answer waiting. Although I would be interested in your answer, there are none coming. I also have my own answer. So I want to read you some extracts, and uh, I'm assuming we all have this book. If not, uh, I'm going to make a reference to the quotations from this book. And I'd like to point out some of the phrases, uh, starting with uh, sorry, I just lost my spot. Here we go. Uh, starting with uh, in page six, uh, she says that uh, her mother's hair, like little rosettes, like little candy circles, the way her mother has done her hair like little rosettes flowers, but little candy circles suggest that the rosettes are like a decoration on an iced cake. And then on page seven, she says that mama's hair that smells like bread. On page 17, she refers to the shy ice cream bells giggle of Rachel and Lucy's family. Rachel and Lucy's family has a shy ice cream bell jiggle. She says on page 30 that Angel Vargas, quote, dropped from the sky like a sugar donut. Now, I want to say that uh, I have seen friends of mine in my youth fall from tree limbs, uh, survive the fall. Um, she's talking about dropping from the sky because she's talking about his being daring as if he's flying. Uh, I would never be able to make a comparison between anyone falling from any height and a sugar donut. Keep that in mind as, as we move on. On page 34, uh, she refers to that one next to the one that looks like popcorn. Now, I don't even know what it means to look like popcorn, but I love that she wrote that. On page 39, she says of her grandfather, his feet were fat and doughy like thick tamales. On page 43, she says that the special kids at school get to eat in the canteen. They don't have to go home. The canteen, she says. Even the name sounds important. Well, of course, the Spanish version of that is where we got the word. Cantina gave us canteen. On page 77, she says of her own father that when he came to this country, the only word he knew was ham and eggs. That is ham and eggs written as one word, ham and eggs. And then remarkably, on page 104, a baby that has died becomes, quote, that little thumb of a human in a box like candy. Another extraordinary simile, uh, a comparison that has the marker of like, like thick tamales, like popcorn, um, like a sugar donut, uh, like candy. Uh, so now that I've answered my own question, I will ask you to put your thinking caps on and tell me what you make of that. That's a dozen, and there are more uh, references, often striking because although some things are very apt, a mother's patterned hairstyle being like rosettes or 
candy circles, but a baby in a box like candy, because so small, a boy falling like a sugar donut, someone looking like popcorn. Um, I welcome any comments. Th this is what I intended this evening, and it's going to be something similar with the shawl, which I hope you also find uh, a disorienting but engaging novel at the same time. And also, it's very short. Um, you may be inclined to read it twice. It's not a bad idea. So, Michael, any takers? Well, first, the first reaction to your initial question, in terms of what do you, what do you feel that we get out of this be, uh, beyond just what you would get from a normal, a sort of quote unquote normal novel, is the large large number of characters portrayed in different settings. So maybe the point being, it's not so much that these characters are fully developed, but that there are quite a wide variety of them presented juxtaposed with different environments. Michael, this is your comment or from a patron? From a patron. Okay, I, I, I'm only distinguishing that I wanna thank the patron rather than thanking you for that comment. Yes, and isn't that exactly the impression we have of our neighborhood? that our neighborhood has lots of characters. Some of them are stereotypes or very uh, cardboard sort of characters. We only know them by their nickname or we know how they dress or we feel they're dangerous or maybe a little uh, ignorant or wild. Um, and isn't it the nature of actually experiencing a neighborhood as an inside outsider, somebody who lives there, but maybe feels themselves as someone having come from another culture that we experience them uh, in a kind of uh, crowd way. And uh, you know, if you were one of those diligent students in a high school class who was keeping a little notebook on every character who was introduced, you'd feel frustrated by the amount of work you were putting in because most of the characters don't figure beyond the few lines or the short paragraphs, the, the mini vignette uh, where they're introduced. They come and go. Some characters, of course, do repeat. And uh, her sister and Esperanza, Hope, is central to the story. But what was just described is very much, I think, of how we see the population of a neighborhood. You know, I grew up with people I knew and saw every week for years, and I didn't know their last name. I, I didn't know anything about their family. I just knew that was Tony, and he hung out down by the handball courts. and. He seemed kind of shady, and that was enough. Well, they're sort of like they're they're like characters in a movie, not so much you know pure extras that are only there for a split second, but they're like characters in a movie that you need to to fill in the whole environment where the where the story is taking place. And also to be more direct, this is how she experienced her life. Uh, she was in an urban neighborhood uh, in. Uh, Chicago, unlike um, uh, Call It Sleep, which is much more existential, philosophical, much more um, Joycean, um, Call It Sleep doesn't have a lot of neighborhood types. It has some very important central figures. Uh, this is a different kind of experience of uh, Sandra Cisneros and by extension then uh, Esperanza. So, no, yes. So I, Janet's commenting that all the food similes reflect the warmth of the family neighborhoods and the author's own family. Yes, and I want to say that um, when I taught this course once as a guest lecturer in a high school course, and I asked that question after pointing out to them uh, the food references, I first made it more Socratic than I am today. Uh, I wanted to teach them more about how to read that I'm doing with you adults today, but I asked them to find some of their own. And because they had associated a uh, food with hunger, and I think they knew of American hunger and they knew of Richard Wright's literature and his using the metaphor of hunger uh, about his uh, deprivation growing up and actually being hungry. And of course, it's a sad fact that many people who are not mainstream Americans do have that experience. But of course, you only have to read through it again and see that it's about savoring life. It's about sweetness, whether it's candy or rosettes or 
a sugar donut. Uh, it's about the importance of food to culture, to community. We get our word companion from the Latin root of having bread with someone. The cum is with, the panion is panis, is bread. Your companions are the people you eat with. <clears throat> and I do think that when you don't have the usual big ticket markers of a novel, you have to think small in the sense of attentively. What is the texture of this prose? What kind of system of comparison is being revealed in this author's narration? People do not reveal themselves in literary works through argument. They reveal themselves through comparison. Um, uh, the Catholic theologian and Victorian writer, John Henry Cardinal Newman, uh, said that uh, no person, he said man, but I'll say person, will fight to defend a syllogism, a logical uh, fact, but they will fight to defend what the crucifix or the British flag stands for. Uh, a man, he said, will not die for a syllogism, but he'll die for a metaphor. We care about the things we compare to something else. And one of the best ways to know the relationship between something and something else is what they have in common and how they're different. This is not a girl who goes through the neighborhood hungry. This is a girl who goes through a neighborhood where you can imagine the smells of the food, the sight of food, ice cream trucks, candy, popcorn is an exciting part of her life. Now we all, I hope uh, you were not so deprived that you didn't have popcorn and candy and ice cream trucks, Mr. Softy in my neighborhood, music that would make you want to open a vein, but there it was um, in your past. But this is a celebration of the culture of um, comfort. Uh, when the writers get together um, in the introduction and they publish an anthology, they call it emergency tacos. The writing that they do are emergency tacos, a taco, something to sustain you, uh, to fill you, to uh, wet or fill your appetite um, when you need it most. I think it's very dear to think of it that way. Yeah. So here's a comment from a different direction. The, uh, the quote, we all have different hair thing, made me think of Joyce's portrait of the artist in that it suggested the acute observational point of view of the young child as remembered and communicated as a particularly sensitive artist. Yeah, uh, well, I, I think that's a, a very apt and insightful comment. I, I want to ratchet it back a little bit to say, uh, I am sure that there are men and women um, in the Zoom group tonight um, whether you identify yourself with a particular demographic or not, who recognize that an important part of growing up is your hair. Uh, and if you are someone who traditionally has hair that is seen as non-American hair, I think you all know what I mean without my explaining, and have to make a decision about whether you're going to treat it to look more like Americans, how you wish your hair would be dyed or straightened or whatever, uh, hair becomes an important part of self-representation, and so do shoes. And there's a lot of references to shoes in the book. Uh, at one point, one of the persons in a store tells the girls that they're dressed in a dangerous way, um, that you shouldn't wear black, that what you're wearing uh, is just dangerous. And uh, feet and hair, feet and shoes and hair are markers of representing your culture or passing or blending in. And again, the book does not have a lot of stress on what does it mean for me to be an American. It is a much, it, it's a book that doesn't have trauma. It doesn't have angst. I think because she's made her peace with wanting to write about the desire to be a writer and the desire to have a house and the introduction makes it clear that those are parallel uh, and congruent wishes. If she has a house, she will be a writer. 
and that there's a kind of therapeutic healthiness in that that's very different from a lot of books by quote unquote minority authors or women who are trying to make an argument against the oppression of America. This is a celebration of America by having a novel that can be written this way about this person in that day back in 1980. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, Elizabeth says, to me, these odd and creative descriptions are the communication keys to the different lens that the writer is seeing the world through. It is clear that she sees things differently because of her background and culture, but also I think because she is unique. Yes, and I'm gonna, Elizabeth, thank you as always. And I'm gonna pick up on that uh, to move to a point I wanna make sure we don't ignore uh, as we now get to the last uh, 10 minutes or so of the evening. So, um, uh, it's clear from the introduction that she has a literary sensibility. She makes references to many writers, mainstream writers, uh, men, Anglos, uh, Latinx writers, and so on. She also talks about the walls of a room being white as typing paper. Uh, that's a writer's kind of comment. Um, only someone who has been faced and welcomed or challenged by the blankness of a page would describe white walls as white as typing paper. In Phillips Roth's great memoir about the dying of his father called Patrimony, if you've never read it, I recommend it to you. If you are not a fan of Philip Roth's novels, I still recommend it to you. Uh, he goes upstairs where his father, near the end of his life, has shat himself, has shat himself in his pajamas in bed. Uh, and uh, he's asked his son not to tell anyone who's downstairs at the party that this has happened. And Philip Roth, as a grown man, has to clean up the mess. And he takes his father, he takes off his pajamas, he puts him in the shower, he cleans him up. Uh, and then he has to go back to the room that is now soiled. And Philip Roth says in the memoir, uh, I didn't know where to start. It was like beginning a new book. And you think to yourself, well, I'll, I'll give myself an example. I would never face such a room and think it's like beginning a new book. I wouldn't think of a sugar donut either. But if you're a writer who knows the burden of starting anew, of facing a blank piece of paper, you might think that. In uh, the, the uh, section called Hips on page 49, uh, you got to use your own song. You got to make it up, you know. I'm talking about literary uh, aspects of the book. Um, in Born Bad, she reads her poems to her aunt, and the aunt tells her, you just remember to keep writing, Esperanza. Uh, it's got to be uh, that that actually happened. You feel the strength of that. Edna's Ruthie says that books are wonderful. Ruthie shares with Esperanza that she used to write children's books once, did I tell you? Whether or not that's true, that's an interesting thing for one young woman to say to another. Uh, the way that metaphors and similes of literature uh, find their way into the prose of the book, our Earl of Tennessee, uh, page 70, uh, is where that begins. On page 71, we're told that Earl has two little black dogs that leap and somersault like an apostrophe and comma. That is charming, and I don't mean charming as a trivial word. I aspire to be charming. I'd love to be charming. Uh, that the writer can describe these two little black dogs that jump around like an apostrophe and a comma. And of course, an apostrophe and a comma are exactly the same shape. They just different for where they are uh, relative to the line of the pro, the types. This is someone who is thinking about typing paper and thinking about punctuation. Uh, page 84, a Minerva, she finds out, writes poems. So, you know, again, going back to Newman, we find out something about the nature of a person, whether or not he or she is a writer, about how they think in terms of comparison. Uh, someone 
estimated that in regular everyday speech, we give a simile or metaphor about every other sentence. It's just everywhere. Uh, you can't take a news story because they're writing differently. But if you were to take a recorded conversation of people at a diner or someone on TV giving a talk about what happened to their family, and you're attentive to how many things are not literal, people are talking in terms of metaphor and similes all the time. And of course, most of them are dead uh, metaphors. That is, we, we, we no longer pay attention to where the poetry goes. We sit at the head of the table um, or the foot of the bed and we don't think about the metaphor there. Shoulders, roads have shoulders because in the old days they were built up, not down. And you would pile up dirt to make a road higher than the countryside. And so the sloping sides of the road were thought of as shoulders. But um, when you have a writer who's writing about language or using language to write about herself, metaphors and similes are constantly going to come in because that's the nature of a writer. One of the best ways to describe your experience, experience of something to someone you haven't met is to talk in terms of something else. I don't know what it's like to be a boy falling out of the sky, but I know what a sugar donut is. I know what a rosette is. I can imagine what the tiny thumb of the infant who has died might look like candy in a small box just by virtue of its sweetness, the poignancy of its death, and the size of the casket, and so on. So I, I want to say with an eye to sort of wrapping up that um, Wordsworth says at the end of uh, Tintern Abbey that he no longer has the immediacy of his imaginative perception the way he did when he was a young boy. He could run through nature and be connected to nature without even having to think about it. And then he got to be more meditative and he started to write poetry and was more self-aware of the connection between nature. And then he found that as he got older, um, those skills were waning. And he says that although there's a loss, for the loss there is abundant recompense. That for the loss of the immediacy of the excitement that is almost physical and visceral, he has a more meditative view of nature and poetry. And I use that detour to say, in her case, the, the use of her, her language, and I think it's second nature to her because she's so writerly, is abundant recompense for the markers of what we usually look for in a novel. And the, the advice to a reader of such a book is, try to meet the book halfway. And if you didn't notice the pattern of food metaphors until I pointed them out to you, uh, don't be despondent. Uh, know that you have a challenge the next time you read a book that seems slight or unliterary. Uh, I'll say more obviously, some of the themes, images, words that recur are house, of course, relatives, either in general or particularly named relatives, people's names, women and the status of women, the idea of danger, which of course to anybody in an urban environment of any background, male or female, whatever age, can be something that is always present. Sex and death in both the general way of life for a writer, but also uh, more local. Uh, and stories and fairy tales and myths appear quite often. Uh, she says at one point, in the intro that she could only tell about ideas with a story. She could only give her ideas in stories. And it reminded me that Ralph Waldo Emerson, a great American writer from the mid 19th century, found that he could only give ideas in poetry and in essay writing, in rhetoric and in poetry. And even though he admired the great fiction writers of the day, and there were many and impressive ones uh, of uh, Hawthorne and um, later on Mark Twain, James Fenimore Cooper, um, Melville. Uh, he could not get out of his own way sufficiently to invent a story. He had to tell his beliefs of self-reliance 
or the American scholar by writing more or less in his own voice. And although he was a, I'd say, minor poet, it was the same uh, characteristic. He was writing as a philosopher, espousing his philosophy in poetry. Uh, I don't mean to say that he was a lesser writer for that, but he wasn't wired for fiction in the same way some writers of prose are not wired for fiction, which is why they write memoir or nonfiction. <clears throat> She's writing fiction that's also partly autobiography. <clears throat> She's writing English and Spanish. She's writing as uh, a Mexican-American and all that doubleness. Um, I think she found that the only way she could say what she was thinking was through a story, and it shows itself on every page. She basically made a new kind of storytelling, and this notion of a novel composed of pieces um, was revolutionary in its day. <clears throat> I appreciate your coming along this far for the ride. Next time with the shawl, uh, we have um, generations of women, one woman in particular, set briefly in a concentration camp, and then more fully in New York by a sidebar, and then in Florida. Again, it's short. I recommend you read it slowly, and if you can, read it twice. And uh, thanks again for coming along for the ride. Thank you, Michael. Well, thanks, Mark. That was that was really excellent and illuminating. Um, uh, as I, I mentioned to you that I couldn't get a couldn't get my hands on a copy of it, so I'm very much looking forward to reading it. Michael, you're a victim of your own success. Well, hell, I mean, we love it when the books are off the shelf, but then I can't get one myself. So uh, I'll do better for next week, I promise. <laughs> but uh, thanks everybody for coming, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. And we'll see you all. We'll see you all next week. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks again. Thanks, Mark.